Good day, viewers. This is David Oliveira, the Preaching Humanist. That is uh, another good topic today. Why faith? What is the importance of faith? What is the difference of belief faith and trust faith? I used to have belief faith as a strong Christian. This whole book called the Bible, the whole belief system of Christianity and Islam and all supernatural beliefs are based upon this thing called faith. There is a major difference between belief faith and trust faith. Number one, all humans possessed a certain type of faith. I don't like to use the word. It has a Christian or religious connotation. It's the same thing in a synonym of the word that I like to use, trust. I have trust faith. You have trust faith. I have faith that Mark, my producer, would be here this morning because I know Mark. He's trustworthy. He was here. I have faith, or otherwise known as trust faith, to believe that my co-host will be here at a certain time because I know them and I know they will be here on time. And as I use this analogy when I talk to Christians and Muslims many times, when they tell me falsely that I have faith to be an atheist, oh no, it doesn't require faith. It's the absence of faith. It is without faith. I have faith and trust faith in a chair that I'm sitting on. This chair has been manufactured and produced in a factory by human beings for one thing, to support a human being in this position. So yes, I have trust faith that this chair will hold me up 99.999% of the time, unless there was a malfunction somewhere in the plant or in the inspection line, something went wrong. But for the most part, I trust that this chair will hold me up. Versus belief faith. Where do Christians and other Christ believers get the idea that they have to have faith? Why is faith good? Where do they get the idea? Of course, right back to the source called the Bible. Hebrews chapter 11, probably one of the most famous chapters in the entire Bible. Let's look at verse 1 through 2, and we'll end. Now faith, now remember, this is not reality. This is belief faith. Belief faith is the assurance or the certainty. That's unbelievable, but oh yeah, it is true. They do believe this. It is the certainty of things hoped for. Now what are you hoping for if you believe in this supernatural concept. Most believers are waiting for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. That's all in the New Testament. You hope for better things to come. You're told through biblical preaching and teaching that there is a better place above and beyond, which is called heaven, right? So this is belief faith, not trust faith. Now, it's interesting they call it the certainty. I talked to a young man yesterday when we were out doing interviews and talking to believers and atheists at the Alamo in San Antonio. We had a young man who was a Christian. We interviewed him, and I asked him, are you 100% certain that there's a God? Because what you believe to be true does not necessarily make it true. And he actually admitted to me that he wasn't totally sure. He believes it because there's a difference in belief and knowledge. So I asked him, so you are an agnostic Christian, and he conceded. He said, yeah, I'm an agnostic Christian. So at least he was honest. But there are many believers that are 100% certain of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So this is what belief faith does. Now, keep in mind that faith, belief faith, is not a tool for discerning truth. It's a tool for allowing people to accept falsehoods. It faith can be used for anything. It can be used to justify anything. And that's where it gets a little scary. You can justify through faith many things, whether they're good or bad. Now, verse 2 of Hebrews 11, for by it, it is faith, belief faith, blind faith. The men of old gained approval. What does that mean? The men of the Old Testament allegedly gained approval because of verse 6 here, without faith, it's impossible to please God. It pleases a God if you have blind faith. Verse 3, by faith we understand. Now, this is unbelievable. 
It says here, by blind faith in the supernatural, we who believe, people that believe, understand that the world or the earth was prepared or created by God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. That actually doesn't make any logical sense. We know, science shows, that this natural world has no indication, no evidence that there was anything supernatural that created it. Probably one of the favorite parts of the Bible, which I used to use as a young Christian all the time, John chapter 20, I'll paraphrase this story in the Bible. Jesus allegedly was crucified, rose from the dead, and he was walking around in his resurrected body. You know the story. Jesus walked through the walls in his resurrected body. He showed himself to 11 of the disciples. They believed because they saw, right? Doubting Thomas was not present, my favorite of all the alleged disciples. Doubting Thomas was a skeptic, kind of guy I like, right? We're all skeptics as atheists. We want to see evidence and truth based upon reality. Thomas was there eight days later. And Jesus, zombie Jesus, came back again knowing that Thomas, the doubter, was there. Walked through the walls. Thomas looked up and said, who are you? I'm Jesus. Now, prior to this, Thomas told the eleven. After they told him, we just saw Jesus. It's true. He's resurrected. Everything he said was true. Doubting Thomas said these wonderful words. He said, I will not believe until I see. What was he wanting? Real live empirical evidence. This is called reality. This is not blind faith. This is not belief faith. This is real live evidence. He was searching for that. He said, I will not believe until I see, until I touch, until I see the nail print hands, until I touch the hole in his side and the nail prints in his feet. So eight days later, Jesus came back again, walked right through the walls. Woo, it's a miracle. Walked right through in his resurrected body, went straight up to Thomas and said, Thomas, touch the hole in my hand. Touch the hole in my side and touch the holes in my feet. And do not be unbelieving, but believe. And of course, this fictitious narrative, otherwise known as a myth, the story goes on to say that Thomas said, oh, my Lord and God, and conceded, it is true. (laughs) That's what the Bible is constructed around, to have pure faith, pure belief faith, in something that you cannot test, that you cannot see. According to Hebrews 11, this is how you should live if you're a believer. Not good enough for me. Now, interesting to know, like I said a few weeks ago, and I repeat myself again, these words of Jesus, allegedly, he said, oh, Thomas, you only believe because you saw. That's called reality. And then he went on to say, but blessed, happy to be envied, are those who have never seen, never required real live empirical evidence, using science as the arbiter of truth, but you're happy to be blessed are those who don't require any of that, but just believe. Just like Hebrews chapter 11, 1 and 2 says for you. It doesn't make any logical sense, even to believers that I talk to, that they're 100% certain of things they have no idea are true or not. You got to believe it. Not good enough for me. So yes, I do have faith. I have trust faith. I have trust in things and people that I know are to be true. So why faith? You can have trust faith. You don't need blind faith in the supernatural. And welcome back. I got my buddies here with me today. Regular Eric here. Hello, And we're going to discuss all of our fun we had yesterday I uh, almost said Georgetown. We go to Georgetown so often, but we went to San Antonio, the Alamo, yeah. the other day. And yeah. we're gonna Heart of some, Texas. Yeah, but we had some great activism. It was, it was pretty cool. And uh, we have a guest here. This is Reggie. Reggie, welcome to my show, or our show. Welcome, Reggie. Thank you. Thank you. I just met Reggie a few minutes ago. Uh, I was preparing for my uh, other show. And he walked in, and I introduced myself to him, and we had some good talk. 
So, Reggie, you are living currently in Atlanta. Is that yes, right? That's correct. And what are you doing here in Austin for the day? I am here to participate uh, in uh, the Atheist Experience uh, later on today and just take part of this great organization that uh, has been very influential to me. So I'm here to just take it all in. Beautiful. Awesome. Yeah. So you're going to be on the Atheist Experience. Mm-hmm. You're going to be on live. That's cool. So I thought this would be good for him to kind of break him in to be on my little sh- our little show here mm-hmm. before he goes live uh, tonight. So tell us a little bit um, about your background, how you were raised, and if it was religious, and give us a little of your testimony. Sure. Um uh, I started a group called Haitian Free Thinkers in 2012. Um, I'm originally from Haiti, uh, born there, came over to the U.S. permanently in uh, late 88. Um, so my background is Catholic. My family's background is Catholic. I eventually became a, a Baptist on my own free volition. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, I joined the National Guard after high school uh, to pay for, 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 for school. 9-11 happened. Got deployed to uh, Iraq. I started reading the Bible while in Iraq, thinking I was going to die. Mm. And uh, starting from the beginning, and that was the, the, the beginning of, of me eventually becoming an atheist, uh, eventually in 2009. Mm-hmm. And then the earthquake happened um, in Haiti in 2010. And um, two years later, I started the group hoping to provide the same kind of uh, services and information uh, to the Haitian population that um, the ACA does for American audiences here. Right. Interesting. Now, you you made a comment to me earlier about the atmosphere, what you feel or see here. You were you came into Houston, I think you said, and mm-hmm. then you did uh, drive from Houston up to Dallas Fort Worth mm-hmm. and then down to Austin. What what did you see or feel here in Texas versus what you're accustomed to? Well, um, before coming to Texas Live, I've heard a lot of things uh, about the state, and it's very proud, fierce of its independent history. And I see a lot of stuff about Sam Houston, and I don't know too much about him. Yeah. And the religious climate is overt, uh, to be to be polite. Um, mm-hmm. So it's it's a little bit more in your face than it is in Georgia, where I live. Mm. So um, Really, I would have expected much of the same in Georgia, but it's not. No, because uh, you know Atlanta is considered the blue island in the in the Red Sea, mm-hmm. and I'm from Miami. It's the same kind of thing, you know, more metropolitan. Mm-hmm. But here, the billboards a lot more um, aggressive, hmm. more in your face, and more. I see more of them. It's not that there's there aren't any in uh, in the Atlanta area. It's just that this is a lot more in your face and very singular in that it's Christian. Mm-hmm. And Christian and more Christian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're very proud of it. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. You said you live in a island, the Blue Island. So, mm-hmm. I guess most of us would understand that, right? That most yeah, of it's the United too. States, yeah, the major cities, more secular, more educated. A little yeah. correlation there. Yeah. Uh, maybe causation, correlation, mm-hmm. and then you get out of the big cities. We have what you experienced, maybe driving from Houston to. Fort Worth. Yeah, that and just driving out of South Florida, the same thing. I remember going to um, Camp Blanding and seeing um, they had uh, crosses hanging from trees. Oh, my goodness. Um, very uh, very overt um, symbols of Christianity. Yeah. I remember driving from New York down, I think in Virginia, they had the, there's a giant cross. It's very intimidating. Yeah. So that's that kind of icon- iconography everywhere here. Yeah. And so yeah. I'm very familiar with what the message is they're trying to send. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I sense the same kind of passion in you as a lot of us here at the ACA have as far as activism, wanting to make a difference and so forth. Uh, how do you see the secular movement and the atheist movement going in the continental U.S. right now? Right now, I think it's dramatically different from when I first started. When I was coming in uh, 2009 when Hitchens was alive, Harris was doing his thing. Mm-hmm. There was so many diversity, and it was such a um, energy uh, from different aspects. Mm-hmm. Right now, I think it's a little bit stagnant. I think the politics of the country as a whole is, I think, on everybody's minds, and I think that's the primary thing that we're dealing mm-hmm. with. But, um, yeah. but you know, there's still so much work that needs to be done, and um, it's it's become so. Like, I take it for granted, and that's probably why, like, it doesn't seem so new. I think that most people who become uh, atheists, like, they go through this curve 
where like it's exciting at first and you get used to it. Mm-hmm. But I, I still enjoy doing it. I have a big passion for everything that we're doing. Yeah. And so that's why. Move to Austin. <laughs> yeah. No, maybe we we need him over there. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So that's why that's why I felt like it was such a great opportunity and an honor to be here, and and um, I just love it. This is this is everything that I'm passionate about. I'm so glad awesome. you're here. It was very nice to meet you. I'm glad you're on the show too. So, um, well, Eric, let's talk for a little bit about yesterday. Eric and I and Andrew took a drive. Not too far, just, uh, what, 80 miles down the road to San Antonio yep, to the time. Alamo. And I thought about what a beautiful place to go to do our activism, which we normally do around the Austin area with our signs. Dadgummit, I forgot to bring the signs. They're in my car. But many of you have seen our signs that we hold up. So we were out there at the Alamo yesterday. So, Eric, you tell stories better than I do. So you go ahead and tell the viewers what happened yesterday. Uh, well, you know, it was a variety of things. Actually, uh, some really uh, good conversations with fellow atheists. Um, we had conversations with, actually, you know, if you count them all together, about five preachers out on the street. Oh, yeah. um, and, you know, it was good. It was a good mix. We had a uh, a, a preacher who was, we set up our, um, where we were set up, right in front of the Alamo, right along a little wall, um, and then right Catty corner from us was another guy, two guys and a, and a lady, and they set up in this one of them, the, one of the males stood up on the little wall, and he was preaching out towards the Alamo, yeah. towards all of the um, people that were there, and then Andrew saw his yeah. chance. <laughs> Andrew loves that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, he, he does. Yeah, he He's loves, been talking he's about this at for it. years. He's yeah. good at it. He's really good at having those kind of conversations. Yeah, he is. And so he said, let's walk over there. I, I, I'd already set up all of our, our stuff. We did a little filming right there first, and yeah. then it was simple to move over. So we did, and, and uh, we talked, and, uh, you know, of course, you know, we tried to question their reasoning to believe, yeah. and they threw the old, same old, you know, things at us, you know, the quotes from the Bible, and you know, we never, we of course, we never think we're going to change our mind, but we wanted to have the conversations with them, and we did. Yeah. You know, um, the guy told us that you know, well, usually he was surprised by us and our demeanor. Yeah. He says uh, we were you know, actually nice. Usually, right? you know, the atheists. He said <laughs> the atheists. Um, they're they're angry and they come up and they yell at me and everything. And of course, you know, that's not what we do. No. You know, um, so we did. We got to have some conversations. They didn't. They you know they didn't clear anything up for me about religion yeah. or God. To tell you the truth, <laughs> it's so interesting though. They they use the Bible. Reggie, I'm sure you've talked to many believers. F- evidence for them is they take the scripture. Yeah. And I saw the I saw the lady, the one that was once ca- a Catholic, the Latino woman, who yeah. now saw the John three three. You must be born again. Now she was a true Christian now, but as evidence for God, she took her Bible out, and I knew exactly where she was going to Romans chapter one. You know, look at the trees. You're without excuse. Yeah. And then I quoted it for her before she even got there. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting that all they do is quote the book, the Bible, as evidence. Right. And and the then the main male preacher he also said the same thing yeah. you know and he said you know look at the trees and look at the and so you know of course I yeah. told him you know I said you know do you absolutely understand though that that tree can be explained better through a scientific explanation yeah. and it is then you're explaining in any way shape or form through this book you know I mean yeah. it's not a, it's not even a comparison about a true explanation that somebody can truly understand in a rational way you're asking us to believe that. That happened, so, and it didn't. So let so. me cut in here for a second. I want to make sure the viewers understand. When we go out and do this type of activism, now, remember, I used to be a Christian evangelist. This is easy for me. It's fun talking to people. Uh, but we're not trying to cause trouble. We're not subversive. Those of you that have gone out with me and Andrew and Eric and the others, we put a smiling face on. We're very, very cordial Absolutely. We put a face on that which is being demonized. We represent what good ethical moral people are, and we do push secular humanism, right, being good without God. That angers a lot of people. But we like to challenge people, and we like to attempt to normalize atheism. So that's why you really have to make sure you're, you have compassion and empathy for people that still believe in God. Yeah, absolutely. For the people, not the belief. (laughs) Exactly. And, you know, that's absolutely the first thing because people will ask us, what are we doing? When they see us with our signs and everything and they'll say, well, what are y'all doing out here? What is y'all's point? And we always say we are here to normalize atheism. We're here to let 
everybody know that atheists are just normal people. We are fathers and mothers and sons and daughters and we're nurses and we're policemen and we're everything. And, you know, we just want to put that, you know, out there because it's true yeah. and, and, and remove that stigma. Yeah. So hopefully people who are afraid to come out will come out. Remember the two young ladies That's we right. talked to? Absolutely. Reggie, I was telling you about the two uh-huh. little girls. Yeah. Girls. Yeah. They were probably 19 or 20. Yeah. Do uh, you want to tell the viewers about that? Um, yeah, they two two young uh, Hispanic girls came up to us and uh, were just again they were asking us you know what we were about and who we were and so in talking to them and getting their story they were both Catholic they were both raised in the Catholic tradition both went to Catholic school mm-hmm. and both of them told us that for a while now they've been questioning actually. One of them said that she doesn't believe in God, but it's mm-hmm. hard. She said it's hard to let go of all the things that I've been taught all my life. Um, but, you know, they haven't said anything to their families. And they actually asked us, you know, you know, they asked us yeah. that question. You know, what did y'all do? How did y'all, yeah. you know, come out and, you know. And, you know, I told them, I said, you know, I had some of those same fears when I was, before I let some of my family know that I was an atheist. And I was very surprised at how accepting they actually were. Yeah. And I was also very surprised that a couple of my family members also went, me too, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) and that surprised the heck out of me. But, you know, and so, you know, they were very uh, intelligent. They were college students, um, you know, and and, and they were seeking. They were seeking the truth. They were asking the right questions. Now, remember, we did ask them the questions I love to ask people that are right on the fence. And those are people we really want to help, right? People that are questioning and they're on the pathway of truth and reality. I asked her, one of the girls, I said, what is keeping you from leaving it and just dropping this whole concept and just progressing on and be, you know, be a better person, just let it go and live, you know? But the two things, you remember what she said? And this is what I hear from believers now for years and years. Number one was the all very popular, important fear of hell. Yeah. The fear of hell. She said, I'm afraid of that. And number two about repudiation um, or being disowned from her family, which happened to me but on June the 20th. I didn't tell you, Reggie, but back on June the 20th, my very pastor, uh, ex-pastor father disowned me as his son because he found out, yeah, see, I saw the look on your face. Exactly. Because of this, he knew I was an atheist for 30 years. I used to be a preacher with him. We used to travel and preach together back in the day in the 70s and 80s. But after he found out about this, about all this, complete disowning, that's it. It was over. So I wanted to let her know that's possible, yeah. right? It yeah. is. There's just fear. Obviously, I think especially if, you know, you know, the Catholic Church, they can be pretty um, severe, pretty intense. But she actually said that her dad, um, he really didn't follow he didn't go to church. Yeah. She and, and and I think that maybe she has a, a somewhat of an ally there. It sounded like because she said he didn't go to church. He didn't really believe in the things that the church tried to teach. So you know, hopefully that that young lady will have somebody on her side yeah. and somebody to support her. Um, and of course, we told them who we were. We gave them our, our flyer and we said, yeah. hey, I, I mean, one of them had on a UT shirt. I'm not sure if they were UT students. I mean, you know, doesn't mean that they were, but um, you know, we told them, come on, come on by, you know, come down here, you know, we'll support you. Yeah, absolutely. And we gave, we gave out a lot of uh, Atheist Community of Austin flyers. So not only do we engage with dialogue, Socratic method, uh, in, their, in, in their faith, whatever it takes for each particular individual and case, we, we do out there. We have to be a jack of all trades out there. You know, it's all good, all the, the different methodologies. But also, we talked to fellow atheists. Yeah, we uh, actually got to meet a gentleman and his wife um, from the San Jose atheist community. What was his name? Uh, Mar. He texted us. I got it. My but anyway, phone. he yeah he got David's information, and so he he came over and spoke to us. They were really nice people. He told us they have a much easier time, of course, in San Jose, California. You know, doing their things. Um, you know, he's, he was surprised, like a lot of people tell yeah. us, they were so surprised to see us out there in Texas, you know, mm-hmm. doing the, what we were doing. So, but yeah, they were, they were really uh, uh, nice people. They said that he knew what, the, he, he, he had watched the atheist experience, um, you know, so he said, you know, he's, he's going to tune in and he gave us his contact information. So yeah. that was yeah, a, he was, a good they contact were, to make. 
they were many one of many different atheists that approached us. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we, we so many. A lot of the you know the pictures on our uh, that I posted on my Facebook page. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, gosh, man, I mean that was not even half the yeah. people. And also to fellow atheists, because I don't get all my atheist friends agreeing with what we do. Um, but normally those of us that come out of a very strong religious background tend to have, not always, but tend to have more of a passion to be like Moses and go back and set the people free. Huh? Uh -huh. Remember that? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yep. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, we, st we tend to have that passion to really know what these belief systems can do to individuals, how they uh, can really mess people up in so many different ways. But um, also, I tell people when they ask me, even if they're atheists, like yesterday I had a few, like, why are you doing this? First of all, we're in the South, right? <laughs> it's Christianity is infiltrating every part of our community and society, and we do want equality. Yeah. That's it. We want equality for all people. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, like I said, we, we, we encountered a total of probably yeah. five street preachers out there, uh, two of them that were pretty hateful. And we got to talk about that. We're going <laughs> to. And hateful things as people walk by with a megaphone. So absolutely, I think it's necessary for us to counter that. Yeah, uh, we do. We, we got to counter that hate with acceptance and yeah. with, you know, uh, real rational thought. So before we get to the topic, I want to end this up in a couple of minutes because I want uh, Reggie to talk with us too about this. We're going to talk about why faith because okay. I just did an episode earlier on that. Okay. From Hebrews 11, yeah, why faith? But uh, when Andrew was really pushing us to go talk to the other street preachers, yeah. the guys holding up the fear of God sign, I said, oh, why not? So you were doing more of the video and the audio. Right. I was trying to make sure that, you know, what we got was coming to come, going to come across good because it was a very uh, interesting, you know, encounter. And I wanted to make sure it was good. Um, Unbelievable. It was, you know, like I said, it was two guys. One, one gentleman was in a wheelchair um, and he had on a megaphone. Uh, on his chest and a, a loudspeaker, I guess, so to say. And the other guy was holding the sign next to him. And went, Did it say fear, fear God? God? It said fear God. And as people were walking by, they were, you know, saying stuff about, you know, you're going to hell, whatever, yeah, all, the, the, all, Bible. The, all the crap they say. And so we went up there and we started to try to engage them. And the guy with the megaphone, obviously, he was trying to just shout us over. He didn't want to talk to us. But then Andrew got their attention because Andrew's very uh, persistent. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so we did start talking, but he still was just being very hateful, very, you know, judgmental, is still saying, you know, go into hell and all these things. Another theist happened to be coming by on a bicycle, and he got off his bike, and he walked up there, and he told the theist in the chair, you're wrong. And he said, you shouldn't behave this way, and you shouldn't judge people, yeah. and you shouldn't judge these guys, you know? And so, <laughs> yeah. one of the things that they had been telling people before the second theist showed up was that people were sodomites. Well, he, we were called sodomites. We were called he, sodomites. See, he called us sodomites and about every other name in the book, and right. I'll get to that in a minute, but go ahead. So, when the second theist who got off his bicycle came up and, you know, was trying to, you know, speak to the guy and tell him, you know, don't be so judgmental and don't tell people they're going to hell and, you know, you're wrong. That's not what Christianity is about. The guy holding the fear of God sign turned to him and called him a sodomite. Called him, and, a fellow Christian, a sodomite. Yeah, and that guy got pissed off. Yeah, man. that was scary. He walked back over to his bike. He took this bicycle chain and it, was a, it wasn't wrapped in plastic. It was a chain. He wrapped it around his fist and had a lock on it too and he was going to beat the tar out of that guy. <laughs> he was going to show him the love of Jesus. He was going to show him yeah, the yeah. love of Jesus. It's like Jesus with the whip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. It's all you know, which, which is such a, uh, oh, God. a the allegory there. Is just so crazy. we had to stop that. Well, yeah. David, oh. you know, being the good man that he is and the good guy that he is, he was telling that guy, don't do that. You know, try, you know, do that. But I kind of, I was watching that guy and I think he was feeding off the fact that we were filming. You know, yeah, and so I, I went over to David and I said, stop, I'm not filming this anymore. And I told that guy that too. I said, I, I said, man, we're not filming this. I don't know. You know, you're not going to end up on camera yeah. or something. Mm -hmm. And so I was afraid he was going to hit David as well. So we got out of there. Well, that's what Christine's so worried about. She's so, she, she wanted His me to. His anger was me. not directed at us. His anger no. was directed at that other guy. Yeah, not at guy. us. Yeah. He was he actually more yeah. on our side. But the hate. He was. If you would have seen the hate in these guys' eyes, and I know most believers are not like this, but they took it pure Genesis 1 to Revelation, they take it all literally. Uh, he was quoting Psalm 14, 1 to me, you're a fool, a fool has said in his heart there's no God, mm -hmm. and all that. But so anyway. It was a, just a perfect example of, you know, how religion divides people, yeah. even within the same religion, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. um, 
And yeah. unfortunately, right at that very same time, I got a notice on my phone about the shooting in Pittsburgh at the synagogue. In the synagogue, yeah. I mean, l- literally, it was probably about five yeah. minutes after we walked away from that, you know, and it just kind of brought, it just continues to bring everything home yeah. about how hateful and divisive yeah. religion can be. Well, we be. did put a, we did show people out there to, how do you react to violence? How do you react to people calling you names, lying about you? Yeah, because we, we never didn't once call, we didn't call them, them names. names. We just said, man, be nice. And we we're trying to be nice, just exchanging ideas and so forth. So, that's what we do when we go out there. So anybody want to go with us, give me a holler because that's a lot of fun. And we get into good dialogue with, uh, with believers all the yeah. time. So anything else before we go on? You know, the, the biggest part for me about all these, the days we go out and do these things and, even, you know, is I love contacting the other atheists, you know, I mean, and, and them coming up and, you know, knowing that they have a place to be and people who, who will support them. And, you know, um, because people just really don't feel that way, you know, and I think we need to make sure people understand that they do have people who believe that, what they believe and people who will support them. Absolutely. Uh, one more thing that we're going to go on to, why faith? Um, people ask me all the time, fellow atheists, like, well, why would you want to go out there in person and talk to people? Why do you do that? I mean, it's all on the internet now. This uh, in- internet digital dialogue is so effective, and yes, it is. I mean, But it's also so divisive because it can people, be. people feel so emboldened to just say the most horrible stuff, Absolutely. you know, behind that computer screen, you know, and it can turn into just a, a spiral of hate and, you know, animosity, yeah. you know. But And I've been misinterpreted many times, and we discussed this before, like if I write an article, of course, uh, Christine has to edit it for me, <laughs> but if I give messages, people would misinterpret it and think I'm bitter or angry. But when you meet people in person, it's, to me, because I'm old school, it's more effective, you may not reach as many people, but just putting that face on what we really are uh-huh. and interacting with people. So, yeah. Anyway, uh, so I did a little topic about why faith, and I went over the difference of belief faith and trust faith using Hebrews 11 as the premise. Believers had that 100% certainty of God based on Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. So why faith? You know, why is it important? Um, and I explain the difference of belief faith and what we have as humans as trust faith, right? We trust each other. That's trust faith. I trust that this chair was made to hold me up and so forth. So have you had this uh, encounter, Reggie, when you have talked to believers through the years since you've come out of Christianity as far as why they need faith and why it's so important to believe and have 100% certainty in God? Sure. It's come up several times. And I think the answer to the question of why faith is because um, people need, uh, I, I think, what is a synonym to faith, which is hope. Mm-hmm. If they're having a hard time, they need something to kind of hang their hat on that's going to be better. And I think that religion came out of um, people needing um, a sort of comfort. I think that's why it's referred to the opium of the masses, mm-hmm. so that if I literally cannot help person X, uh, this is the kind of thing that comes into handy, that they have faith that everything's going to work out in the future. And I think that's still a powerful um, thing that compels people to still believe, even though a lot of them know that um, the stuff that they believe in might sound crazy on, on the average day. So that's that's what makes it still relevant today, I think, which is, you know, the need for hope. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever had a Christian admit to you that having this 100% certainty, Hebrews 11, 1 and 2, faith is the substance of things hoped for or the certainty or assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Have they ever admitted or conceded and said to you that, well, it is a little crazy or maybe not crazy, ridiculous, it doesn't make logical sense, but this is what pleases God and this is what I need to hold on to my relationship with God. Have you ever had them tell you that? In their own way, yes. And um, I've learned to sympathize with that. You know, um, one of the things that I'm trying to focus more on is to be more sympathetic and not be more technical because I realize that um, believers are more impressed by your behavior than what you know. So I can know what the information that's within all those books that you see there. Mm -hmm. The average Joe just... After a while, it just glazes over and it goes back to the basics of faith and and how it can serve them in their everyday needs. And so I try to be sympathetic of that 
And I think you, I heard you say earlier about it depends on who the person is. And if they want to be a little bit more abrasive, I can get that way too. <laughs> because um, it's it's a toolbox, man. I got a lot of that. And But um, I think that's what most people will tell you why it's still important to them, even though there's a small part of them that know that they're not going to do anything even close to crazy of what the characters in that book supposedly did. So I'm so glad to hear all this. I, I couldn't agree more. It was beautiful what you said. And I like that sympathy and empathy you were talking about. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the important thing we, as very strong atheists for me, or you can call me a firebrand atheist, but it doesn't mean we're angry or very compassionate. What compels us to go out and talk to people are compassion for humanity. Um, I think this is where the secular humanism comes into mm-hmm. play. Yeah. Uh, the importance of that as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, I mean, as humans, you know, caring and being good to other humans, you know, I don't need faith for that. That's just, to me, rationality, you know. I mean, if we're good to one another, then overall we'll have a good result for, you know, the majority of people, you know. I don't need to pray to have a good result. I mean, because obviously I know that's going to do nothing, (laughs) you know. I'd rather be out there helping, Mm -hmm. you know, and actually, you know, hands-on doing something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I I think there's, we can develop practical um, mind experience to show that why this is not really a a good thing in in the Hebrews uh, definition. Uh, Mm -hmm. Recently, you know, the the lottery's gotten really high and I guess both have been uh, claimed by now. And I would ask a believer, like, what, do you have faith that you're going to hit the lottery or would you rather a a system that would increase your odds Mm -hmm. into winning? I think most people would rather a system of knowledge or method to get a greater cha- chance of success rather than having simple faith as provided from the Bible because I think they realize it's not as effective. And that's why um, preachers are ineffective in hospitals because mm, yeah. their faith literally does absolutely nothing. And that's been tested. And it's been tested. And right. they know. They know. And I remember... Yeah. Uh, years ago when I was in church, uh, one of the Sunday school teachers tried to talk about faith and uh, claim that he was going to uh, turn around and drop himself and he had faith that some something or someone was going to catch him. What do you mean him. drop himself? Literally stand up and just and fall. fall. He said that. He was going to demonstrate it live. Oh my and gosh. he didn't do it because, again, they know he was going to get hurt. Yeah. But but he was trying to impress upon us the faith that either God or something was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, again, you, you you can take that and 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 show them that they know. Yeah, they do. It's, know. it's not going to work. Well, they know, but their flock isn't so sure. So that's who they've got. You know, they've got those people convinced, or most of them, or not I mean, some of them convinced. You know, I see the Benny Hen thing. Mm-hmm. You know, and to me. Wow, how does he convince all those people to go along with him? Because you know they're just going along with him. But crowds of people, when he waves his hand and everybody falls over backwards, what a bunch of shit. And everybody's going along with it. That's a brainwashing yes. that if I've ever seen it. Yes. Now, that's my background. Remember? I was a well, Pentecostal preacher. I'm glad no, you ain't doing that. We believe that stuff. Now, remember, though, most of these well, then people— you tell me why they believe it. No, I'll tell you. First of all, number one, it's indoctrination. When you hear it from a child, train up a child in the way he should go, Proverbs 22, Mm -hmm. and when he's old, he will not depart from it. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. We departed from it. (laughs) We were trained up that way. That's a lie. But they're told something to be true from a child. Yeah, it is definitely indoctrination. Yeah. Yeah, and also they're taught authoritarianism, submit to the rulers, Romans chapter 13 or 7, whatever, you must obey them to have the rule over thee. So these are men of God, not women, of course, in the Bible. No. Men of God. So right. there's that fear of breaking authority, yeah. authoritarianism, even though they have doubts. But I never had a doubt for a while, praying for people to be healed and they would die three days later, like the doctor said. Never occurred to me when I was a young preacher until later in life that this could be wrong, you know, so... I think, Reggie, I thought you were going to say something. You had a thought. I think I interrupted you, maybe. Um, I think I was going to say something to the effect of, um, uh, I'm trying to remember. 
Uh, we were talking. But, but but basically, yeah, it's, it, it it doesn't work. It can be de- demonstrated, and I try to uh, sympathize with them, whatever yeah. their situation is, and um, hopefully reach reach out to them and, and find some kind of common ground. Yeah. Because um, it's not an effective tool for our reality, mm, right. and so it can be harmful. Of it. With the Christian scientists and those types of people who, you know, they just, you know, say, don't go to the doctor, don't take their children to the doctor, oh, and, yeah. and children die because of it. I mean, that happens. We see that in the news quite often. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that, that should be criminal. It is. For whatever yeah. reason, yeah. some people have gotten away with it, which right. is why we're still dealing with that kind of thing. But it should be criminal. And I think the law, in a way, could be an ally, but it's not always the yeah. reality because there's such a respect for faith. Yeah. In 2018, unfortunately. So faith, belief faith in these primitive books, the Quran or these gods and these deities, right? Mm-hmm. The Quran and the Bible, Christianity, could be dangerous. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. But, I mean, when you believe this stuff to be true. So when you were talking, Reggie, earlier about reality. Mm. Uh, I, the quote I use all the time is faith Blind belief faith is not a tool for discerning truth. Mm -hmm. It's a tool for allowing people to accept falsehoods. And it, faith, can be used for anything and can justify anything. Yes. So it can be used for bad. Yes. Um, I I think I remember what I was going to say now. You were talking about um, Benny Hinn. I saw for myself in Atlanta Peter Popoff Mm. coming to, I believe, the Marriott and um, I felt so bad seeing, obviously, older people, mm-hmm. sick people coming uh, in desperation, I think, to try to get some kind of miracle from him. Mm-hmm. Knowing his history, it really angered me. But I could yeah. not say anything because I was in my professional standing. I was at work and I yeah. couldn't mm-hmm. interact. And I think the reason why Benny Hinn and those people are um, successful is because someone is not standing up. Um, to the crowd and say, no, it's not going to work. It's not working. I'm not, when you do your your magic, I'm not falling down. Right. And then I think it just takes, you know, that person to, to say, you know, the emperor is naked. Mm-hmm. And everybody say, yeah, it's true. The emperor is naked. I'm glad somebody said something because I felt the same way. Right. So all that to tie it in with, with faith, mm-hmm. it doesn't work. They know it. And we're the people that are saying that the emperor is naked. There you go. Beautiful. Absolutely, yeah. You know, one thing on that same subject with, you know, <laughs> Uh, faith and health and praying for you know people to you know uh, you know regain health for whatever it is and I um, when I first you know started really becoming interested in my atheism and you know I was watching YouTube videos and I saw Christopher Hitchens in a debate and this was after he had already passed um, and the one thing he told I think it was Al Sharpton and he told Al Sharpton because they were talking about that you know prayer heals and this and that and and so of course Christopher Hitchens told him I said so he said so I'll tell you what he said find a person who has lost a limb a finger an arm a leg whatever pray for that limb to come back it'll never happen right that will never happen if you could pray for somebody's cancer to go away you should be able to pray for that limb to grow back too and of course I can't remember what Al Sharpton said but it was stupid Mm -hmm. but um I mean, that's so that 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 really cuts right to it, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. And it's all very testable, and that's what I like to talk to believers about. You know, this can be tested. Your faith, and I quote scriptures about what Jesus said. You know, the works that I did to all who believe in John 14. You speaking to all believers, even in the year 2018, will do the same works and miracles and signs and wonders and all that by faith as I did, and greater works. You'll do even greater things than I did. And I tell that to believers, and they go, I can't do that. <laughs> Let me pay back on what you were saying about the limb and everything. Um, what do you call that psychosomatic effect when somebody believes on something and it seems to work? Uh, um, the term is escaping me right now. Um, power. Um, when, when you believe, like, you know, it's been done in hospitals that they give them, like, sugar pills instead of the placebo the effect. Placebo effect. Yeah, yeah, placebo. See, so once um, <laughs> believers, if they learn about the placebo effect, then, again, it— makes them think about whether or not faith really works. But that if there were if there was one benefit to having faith, that would be that. But we understand that to be the placebo effect. Right. And that's understandable through science and yes. learning and testing it. Yes, yes. But if there was one benefit, I would say that probably be that uh, from faith. But they 
tie it to their religious background. Yes. But we know that it's, it's from the placebo effect and we can show them why why it sure. does. And that's why Christopher Hitchens said to, you know, to pray for the growing of the limbs because that's visible, testable, and we know for a fact that it will not happen. Yep. So Absolutely. Yeah, good yeah. point. Good point. Yeah. Yeah, the placebo effect, uh, we had that in the Pentecostal church. Oh, my gosh. We'd get all worked up and prayed up and speaking in tongues and raising our hands and all the shaking and quivering going on. And we felt so good after that, too, all that emotional high and release or quoting the scripture. I remember one time I took a group with me to pray for, uh, I'll never forget, Mrs. Garcia, one of my best friends whose mother was dying of cancer. It was horrible disease. And I was in my mid-20s. This is back in the 70s or whatever. I took a bunch of my uh, youth group from the church with me. We got all prayed up. We believed by faith that all the scriptures and the power and the miraculous powers that Jesus had was in us through the Holy Spirit, just like the Bible said, we had faith. We 100% believed that Mrs. Garcia would be healed of her cancer. Mm -hmm. We went, I'll never forget it. I laid hands on her, like Mark 16 in the Bible. Mm -hmm. We prayed in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. We rebuked the cancer Mm -hmm. in the name of Jesus to be removed. And that's all in the epistle of James as well. Mm -hmm. And, of course, she died three four, four days later. That faith, and Jesus even said, right, in the Bible, if all you need is a faith of a grain of mustard seed, mm-hmm. just a little tiny bit of faith, that's all you need to do something supernatural. That's all testable. Yeah. Folks, I've been there. It never worked. <laughs> mm-hmm. It makes a, a liar out of Jesus, and it is um, so amazing that he, he's gotten away with it, supposedly. Mm-hmm. Um, with that um, for so long because I did the same thing. I read for myself. It wasn't from the pastor. I read in the yeah. gospel said that anything you ask in, in the name of God or whatever, in prayer it believing. Will, and you believe it, it will come true. And Jesus even gave a quantity of faith because a lot of people will say, well, you didn't have enough faith. No, Jesus said that you need a, a mustard seed of faith. Little That's a small deep. quantity. And it did not come true. And so it makes a liar out of Jesus. So he shouldn't be in this position right now. I like this guy. You know, that's, I'm glad you said that because you're right. I've heard people say that to me when we have our conversations and they'll say, well, your faith wasn't yeah, great enough. It wasn't great enough. Right. Know. But, you know, what you just said about the mustard seed, well, Jesus said that. Yeah, so, Jesus said that. Does it really yeah, my matter? faith should have absolutely been enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or you get the, the uh, skeptic's dampening effect. You ever had that one like... Well, go ahead and prove God exists, and let's pray for this person in front of me. I've always given them the supernatural test, and very few people take me up on it, but go ahead and do it. Grow the limb on that homeless gentleman there, which we go feed occasionally in South Austin. And, you know, I'll believe it if you can demonstrate it, you know. And I'll have Christians say, well, no, 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 you can't be there because your, your unbelief and doubting will affect the outcome of it. That's not what Jesus said. <laughs> yeah, that's not what Jesus said. You just need a little bit of faith. And even if my faith is not enough, your faith should be enough. Absolutely. So you go ahead and do the work, yeah. and then we'll see on camera that you are mistaken. Oh, there you go. That hundreds of times. I always tell people, well, come on, meet me under the bridge, grow the limbs on that poor homeless guy, mm. and put it on video. You'll be the first person in the world to ever, ever show something supernatural by faith. Yeah. Right. Um, we have a few more minutes, so let's close this thing up. Uh, one more thing about faith, and there's, there's, I know you listeners are probably saying there's so many more things we could talk about, and we're missing a lot. I know we are. We just don't have time. But how about death and the uncertainty of death? Ah, uh, that's. A, that, I'm glad you said that. I mean, isn't that where a lot of believers say, "Oh, I got to have faith." Yeah, um, yeah. I had a unexpected encounter last night. Uh, just. You know, after we did our had our day yesterday, and I grabbed my dog, jumped in my truck, went downtown Round Rock just to go down there. I was going to go to a coffee shop that I like down there. There was a festival going on called the Dawali Festival, which is a Hindu festival, festival of lights. Um, it was really cool. It really was. I mean, all these people were dressed up, I mean, in these really great, beautiful, the women with beautiful dresses and, you know, jewelry, and the men had on these really nice-looking cool suits and everything, everybody, and everybody was super nice, and it smelled amazing. They were cooking food. It was great. And so I'm walking around, you know, I'm just looking, and, you know, and I talked to a couple of people. I got asked questions because I didn't really know what it was about. <laughs> One guy told me, uh, uh, he, he told me, he said, it's, you know, the Festival of Lights. He said, but it's also a great place to conduct business. <laughs> I thought that was funny. <laughs> But anyway, um, so I'm walking through looking at some booths, and this one gentleman has a book in his hand and a couple of pamphlets, and he 
asked me to come over and talk to him, so I did. And so he went on to to tell me about um, his belief. It was Hinduism and about reincarnation. Mm. And so he was trying to explain to me, you know, about reincarnation and how, you know, it's been going on for millions of years and how, you know, we're going to die and then we're going to come back to something else. And so... Um, you know, and he was showing me his pamphlet and his talking about his uh, the place they have there in Round Rock. And so I listened to his whole thing and then very politely told him, I said, well, that all sounds very interesting, you know. Um, and I said, but I'm an atheist, you know. And so he was, uh, I could see he was a little taken aback, but then he just continued on being a very nice person because mm-hmm. he was inviting me to come out to their center, wherever that is. And he still invited me. He said, that's okay. He said, come out anyway. Uh And so then right across from him was a lady, and she had a a setup with um, some little fake uh, electronic lights, and they had a picture of, I guess it was several deities of the Hindu religion there. And he took me over to her and introduced me, but he didn't tell her that I was an atheist. And so what they, she told me, you know, all these really nice and flowery things about, you know, um, take the light, say the prayer, and she said, it doesn't matter what God you pray to. She said, pray to any God you want. doesn't matter what it is. And, you know, and say that prayer. And then, of course, then I told her, I said, that sounds very nice. I said, but I'm not going to pray. I am an atheist. But she, too, was very nice. Faith. Very yeah. nice. And she, too, continued to invite me out to go to their little, uh, not little, but to their mm-hmm. center. And uh, I'm actually considering it. Ah, it, no, you take are, Manoj with things. you. Hey, Manoj. I know. Manoj is exactly who I thought Former of. Former Hindu, now atheist, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I might Too bad we it. didn't have an extra chair for yeah. you. You could have come in here, but next time we'll talk about it. Okay. So I, I think I'm going to do that. They were super nice people. They were accepting of me. They didn't care that I was an atheist. Of course, you know, I'm never going to be uh, disrespectful to them because they were nice people and they weren't preaching hate. Um, but they're also never going to convince me <laughs> about yeah. it's gonna, I'm going to be reincarnated. But we'll see. I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, to see what they have going on. I know about Christianity, yeah. but not so much about other religions. And well, I'm, I'm curious. Go with Manoj. That'd be fun. Take your video. We could. We'll take the video and audio out there and do some interviews. That'd be pretty awesome. All right, we're going to wrap this thing up. Uh, do you want to say anything else? Any? Uh, well, just thank you for having me here, and it was great, and uh, it's uh, it's awesome, and uh, I look forward to more. Yeah, good. I'm, right. I'm looking forward, Reggie, to hearing you. I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be going home here in a few minutes, but uh, I'll go ahead and tune in this evening when you're on the uh, Atheist Experience show. I think it'll be great. Awesome. See, this got you loose, man. Loose yeah, is a good. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Now yeah. you're ready to get into it. It's like a warm-up. If I'm a personal trainer, so I always tell my clients when I come to your house, be warmed up a little bit. Go for a walk. And all my clients are older people like me. So go out and do your little walk before you work out. So you're all warmed up here, see? Mm-hmm. But back in the old days, we would get warmed up spiritually right. by singing and worshiping the Lord and mm-hmm. prayer. We get all Holy Ghost filled, right? That's right. <laughs> before That's right. we got to it. So. That's right. All right. Well, thanks so much for watching, viewers. And we'll be back next time. And we'll have another interesting topic to talk about. Have a wonderful day. Bye. See y'all next time. Bye.